here, we, you can find a link for the uh, this presentation. There are several links here that you can use uh, later. I will send this to uh, Murat. Can you write the URL here, please? And so people can access at any time. And later I will share in the matter most. So let's jump in. So basically, uh, when you talk about raster data cube, it's important to start with definitions. So there is very generic definition from Coop. Uh, also, data cubes is a generic term used to describe an array with multiple dimensions. So this is actually too generic uh, for me. So and we have a second definition and uh, defined by Apple and Pebbles, Pebbesma. Yeah, I cannot misspell the name. <laughs> so, uh, and basically it's kind of regular dense raster data cube with four dimensional array. So basically it's a combination of longitude, latitude, time, and bands. So sharing the same properties. And like the kind of the, the there are some steps uh, involved in build this data cube. So most of the uh, imagery archives that we have available, they work like when, the, for example, the satellite get the data, we actually, we have a kind of what it's called like image collection. So you have something like, uh, like images that are not perfect aligned uh, in a geometry aspect uh, with the grid cell. And so basically a data cube, it's like a way to convert this set of image collection into a pixel aligned uh, image data cube, as we are seeing here, where you can easily transpose to operation, apply reductions. And I will show how it works in practice. And in general, it's important to understand that when you do this process, uh, you really need to be aware of some uh, like really definitions. And these definitions in general, they are really uh, aligned with the application. So that's why, for example, in the workshop, we will show uh, some, I will show, of course, one example, but. There are, so, there are many platforms, many ways to do that. So it's, it's, in general, it's better that uh, you build uh, kind of a specific data cube uh, design it for a specific application. But uh, at OpenGeo Hub, we, are, we, we do it internally, but we also believe that you can provide some collections and some analysis ready and now cloud optimized, cloud optimized, cloud native formats that can serve multi-applications. So there are always this dilemma. So should I build my own data cube specifically designed for some specific application or should I use some kind of existing data cube and maybe that will be suitable for me? So uh, I don't think there is right and wrong, but uh, when you at least provide some ready to use data cube, you can try to, I think it's important to think that you, maybe you can reach a different community and different set of users. And because building a data cube, it's a quite a specific aspect for, for example, who has like a remote sensing background. And, and so we, we believe that it's, it's, it's good to have both options. So of course, if you want like build your own data cube, you can always trace back and do the whole process by yourself. But we always believe that it's important to provide at least some level of uh, ready to use uh, data cube. And that's what, for example, OpenGeoHub is doing. Uh, so when you build a data cube, you need to define spatial reference system, spatial resolution size, spatial reference, temporal duration, and temporal reference. So there are quite some definitions here. And, and basically for every combination of dimensions, like a cell has a kind of single and scalar attribute value. So, and, and you can also have like um, more dimensions depending on the definition of your data cube, basically. Okay, so, uh, if you think about like all these, uh, like in, in the recent years and, and like for almost one decade now, we have like a really exponential uh, growth in data. So, and here is an example of uh, like four uh, data products, uh, like four Im imagery uh, from remote sensing. So basically modes, Landsat, Sentinel and PlanetScope. And you can see like difference in resolutions, how the data uh, uh, grows from uh, when you go from 250 meter of spatial resolution for three meters spatial resolution one day in Planet Scope. So Planet Scope, it's a commercial product, but uh, for uh, thanks to the NICFI program, you can use for tropic uh, 
with um, a no commercial uh, attribution. But with Sentinel, for example, you have 10 meter and different bands with also 20 meter and a kind of five days resolution. So I talked about it yesterday. So uh, mostly when uh, we want to run like machine learning models or generate mapping products uh, through, through like long time series, we use the Landsat R&D uh, provided by University of Maryland, Matt Hansen's group. So it's a data set where they harmonize it. All the Landsat 5, 7, and 8, they aggregated and created a kind of level 3 product uh, with 16 days of uh, temporal resolution since 97. So and thanks to the uh, partnership with the WRI and the Global Pasture Watch, now we have a complete copy of this archive in our infrastructure. So I talked about it uh, yesterday, but I put my presentation and my slides in the Mattermost if you want to see exactly how we are doing. In total, it's about 1.4 petabytes, and now we are working to kind of create a data cube with that, like complete, consistent, and of course, doing all the definitions that I presented and to produce a kind of global Landsat analysis ready and cloud optimized GeoTIFF. I will show what it means exactly in practice in the next slides. Uh, we also have this important initiative. So they harmonized Landsat Sentinel 2. So Sentinel and Landsat uh, were kind of, actually Sentinel was uh, was actually a kind of cross calibrated with the Landsat. So uh, the Copernicus initiative and ESA and, and NASA USGIS, they all work it together to uh, like before the launch to make the data kind of compatible. And now they are delivering this uh, harmonized Landsat and Sentinel collection. So every two or three days uh, you can access. So you have both ways. So you have a kind of Sentinel um, data that, that goes to uh, 30 meter and you can match with the Landsat at global scale. Now they have a stack catalog with this data. So and you can easily do carries and access it uh, to do, for example, local analysis. And of course, there's also the NICFI data. So uh, the Norwegian government, basically they paid for uh, these uh, monthly uh, images from 2000. Uh, I think it's October 2020. And uh, before that, it's a kind of every six uh, months. And with this data, you basically have RGB in IR. So you can use that to do some analysis with Planet. It's a bit limited, I have to say because they don't provide cloud masks and the data it's in Google Earth Engine. So, but you can, for example, one thing that I, I think it might be useful, they have some WMS service, kind of WMS service, but more like a base map server. So you can integrate it with QuantGIS to do some visual interpretation and at least have a kind of monthly time series to check uh, your data. So all these data are really great, but what we, when we want to use that uh, to really do modeling or do time series, you have some challenges. So basically uh, you have, even that you have cloud masks, you still need to kind of uh, remove the clouds considering some predefined mask that mapped it. Um, uh, when you remove a cloud, you, you need to define a kind of uh, gap filling approach. So how you will fill the gap where was a cloud. And so now, some of these data, they are really like uh, becoming fully accessible through like uh, cloud optimized formats and stack. But I personally think that these really cloud native formats, I will show it in the next slides, but they could be like used in a better way. So because what it's happening, all these uh, big archives, they are just converting, like they are tiling really they, their scenes to cogs. So, but in essence, this format, it's, these cloud native formats, even this, we we have more experience as OpenGeo Hub with cloud optimized GeoTIFFs. You can really create like large mosaics and kind of embed the overview and kind of remove this kind of scenes that are kind of legacy from uh, the way that we were uh, making data available in, since 20 years. Uh, you could embed it in a file format and really take full advantage of this. So for me, that's something that uh, I don't see much organizations doing it because of course it requires a lot of uh, pre-processing and generate this. And when you do that, uh, we believe that you can really boost the usability. So there, we have like a very nice talk about uh, analysis ready and data this morning. Uh, 
provided by Peter. And basically, uh, there are some definitions of uh, how you can define and uh, what we can really say about like analysis ready data. But in a, in essence, in a nutshell, it's it's really like most of the uh, users they when they start, they want to use some uh, imagery archive like remote sensing data. They need to spend a lot of time in data processing. So, for example, uh, some users are interested in you know in in some really surface reflectance so they need to apply some uh, uh, surface reflectance algorithm uh, or maybe the images for example in the beginning like 20 years ago the images were not like really registered so you, sh you it, it was important to co-register the image and, and align all the grid cell so there are several pre-processing steps and now uh, usgis copernicus and and and, and they are they, they are really like working to uh, take this bird and produce, do this pre-processing by themselves. But still, uh, when you do that, uh, you have a kind of second level of analysis that really, it's more like dependent, like application dependent that you can you like remove clouds, aggregate, so, and things like that. Uh, but in essence, this analysis ready data, it's in, 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 in my perspective, it's actually do all this pre-processing in a way that you can provide a more, a product that it's, like ready for at least for some domains and can be easily plugged and integrated in different applications. Uh, of course, if it, the application requires very specific uh, aspects, you need to do these steps by yourself. So, but more recent, we have this kind of cloud uh, optimized raster data format. So they also call it like cloud native format. And for me, this is a very uh, powerful, uh, Thing because it enables like really lazy loading. And what I mean with lazy loading, it's basically when you have these formats, uh, they are kind of designed to be accessed through the uh, HTTP connections to really internet and network, but in a way that you can easily retrieve, for example, the metadata at low cost without downloading the whole file. And after that, retrieve like just data chunks according to your analysis. So, and this is a very uh, powerful concept because uh, you can have, for example, a file hosted in a, uh, in a HTTP provider, in a S3 and cloud uh, object provider, and people can access these files like simultaneously. And just for example, we are providing this uh, uh, Landsat analysis ready and cloud optimized in a S3 and basically, as like several users can go there and just retrieve a portion of the data that they are interested. I don't know, some part in German or in, in Italy and just work with that and bring to their own environment. So it works really like a distributed database and, and it is scalable because you use a kind of uh, cloud uh, solutions to do it. And the format it's designed to allow it and to really scale. So, and that's the thing, in my opinion, it's it's something that we should is explore more as community because if you just get like a bunch of tiles and convert to cogs, you will still need to aggregate and create a kind of a virtual mosaics, but you can do it by yourself and provide a single mosaic that in our opinion, it's really uh, something that can bo boost the usability. So, and of course, and if you have like this big mosaic, so for example, today we have like uh, one file, this uh, kind of, it's a Sentinel data that we process it in the cloud and we kind of aggregate and produce annual mosaics for multiple bands. And it's about, I don't know, 200 gigabytes and it's accessible for everyone. That's, you can just load it and put, for example, in the QuantGIS, visualize quickly or retrieve like parts of the data depending of your analysis. So there is no limit for this. The, what I'm trying to say is this format is scales re really well with the amount of data increasing. So, and if you combine these both concepts, uh, you have something that it's called analysis ready and cloud optimized geotiff, uh, ARCO. So basically that's the concept that uh, Pangeo uh, started using uh, in this paper. And we truly believe that combining these two things, you can really uh, make difference. So, and one thing that it's also, important, this is more like, it depends of the application, but for example, when you work with the Landsat Sentinel, like optical uh, sensors, you need to really see the data. So, and, and to do that, uh, we, we, we did assessment like a, one, two years ago, and we 
kind of decided to use internally this cloud optimized geotiff basically because it provides these three aspects. So the first one is uh, you have compression inside the, the, the format. So for example, you can have like a really like a big file, but when you save it, you do this kind of loss less compression. So for example, if you have a land cover map, all the values of the land cover map, uh, of course you have some classes, but the compression, it's, it works in a very efficient way. So you can have like a really small file even if you have if you are covering larging areas because the compression works really well for this uh, uh, scenario. So and of course with less data, less with a smaller file, it's easy to uh, host it and really uh, provides like for for other users. The other aspect it's the internal tiling system and the overviews. So basically, the overviews is this kind of this pyramid structure. So with this format, you kind of pre-process several visualization levels. It means that you can just get one file, for example, put in the Quant GIS, and all this lazy loading access will, for example, check the first level of the pyramid, just load like a small portion of data, and you can easily visualize, for example, the whole euro. And, and also this, uh, this lazy loading uh, through this uh, cloud native format, it works because it was also designed to uh, be accessible with this HTTP range requests. So you can uh, access different uh, parts of the data uh, kind of independent because it was structured uh, like that. So, and if you think about it, when you put all these technologies together, like cloud native formats, all these, here's a specific for cloud optimized GeoTIFF, but when you host that in a kind of cloud object storage, you get a unique ID uh, unique identifier that here in this case it's a URL and with this unique ident identifier in the whole internet you can have like directly access so you can instant access it and, and really uh, um, load uh, the data through easily like different mechanisms so let me show for example uh, where's my mouse here yeah so this is uh, an example of what we did. So here is the, uh, so we built this a stack catalog. So this is a, a, a data cube that we built for a project funded by a European Commission called uh, GeoHarmonizer. Now the project ended and we are maintaining it through the OMC. And for example, if you look here, we have the Sentinel images. So basically uh, these images were processed by Multi1, Josep that is here. He basically used the AWS to crunch all this data and and like produce a kind of aggregated version uh, from for like month. I, here is actually the ten meters, so these annual mosaics. So and basically he he produced it and we downloaded and we hosted in the in the platform. So for example, here you have different years. So two thousand seven, two thousand. 2021. And if you go here, you have different uh, time reducers or aggregators. So basically, this is the kind of the percentile 20 for all cloud free observations of Sentinel 2. So it was a lot of data that was processed here. And what we did, we created exactly what I was uh, explaining. So if you, for some reason, I cannot get the file, the URL, yeah, here. I don't want to download, but where is the URL? Okay. Here. Yeah, here. Copy URL. This is exactly what I was saying. So we have one URL to access this file. I think it's about almost 200 gigabytes. And this file, it's really cloud optimized and analysis ready data. So basically, when you open it in the Quant GIS, you have everything. You have the... Uh, it's covered the whole Europe. So we defined our land mass. You have overviews and, and this is only one band uh, because it's how, for example, the, it was uh, structured. You could have more bands, but in general, kind of it's better to provide different uh, uh, separate bands. And you can easily drop this file here. And when you do that, so basically Quant GIS here, it's retrieving the whole metadata that I was presenting and getting, for example, what is the size, uh, what are the values here? And 
it's fast because we invested a lot of time in pre-processing it and use at full capacity these cloud native formats. So I don't know how many scenes are necessary to cover the whole Europe, but if you just do it for every scene, you kind of lose the point to use these cloud native formats. Because if I want to see the whole Europe, I need to aggregate all the scenes by myself. But we have the technology to do that in a, and really take full advantage. So this is not like a WMS service or nothing. This is my client, QuantGIS, directly accessing the data. And you can do it like inside of a notebook or a R script. And when you do that, you can play with colors, you can zoom in, and you have a kind of full resolution file here that was really pre-processed to take advantage of this. And I will just put some uh, base layer here so we can zoom in and see that it's... So, and when I start zooming in, uh, it starts really going to the different levels of that pyramid overview and you can really check the full resolution. So when you go to like something like that, it will take like some seconds, but it retrieves, it, it's retrieving now the full resolution of Sentinel. Uh, this is 10 meter. So, and we did that for the whole Europe. So of course, to do it, we took some decisions. Okay, we will aggregate by animal because um, there are several uh, clouds, the cloud mask, there were, were some problems, but we could try to like for every six months and just explore it. So the idea here, it's really demonstrate that we have the opportunity to use it as full capacity. And when you do that, I can easily go here and do, I don't know, some uh, clip operation that it's like support by the uh, Quant GIS. So really point and click. I can clip this raster for this extent. So... And here it's basically like showing like a GDAO command. And when I do that, I'm actually producing like a cop local copy of this file. So I don't need any service to do it for me. I can just access the data and use all the technology that it's around, all the libraries to do it by myself. And, and now I have a, a local copy of it. So that's a, I think it's a good example to show like we, how we can really uh, use that uh, really at full capacity. So, and now we are doing the same thing. We are scaling it for the whole world with Landsat 30 meter uh, as we got this Landsat R&D uh, in-house. Okay, but how I can access all these cloud native formats? Oh, yeah. Sure. When you use that, so... It depends of the application, but with Quant GIS, for sure it use like the full resolution. So when you are here, for example, if I clip like a large area, like the whole country, it will take a while because it's similar to download. But when you work with this, for example, in, in like a computing, like a comp notebook environment with Python and R, you can select if you crop the full resolution or every level of the overview. So you can navigate of that and do it. So for example, with this file here, you could do computing like in the first level of the pyramid, right? You could do computing here. And that's exactly what Google Earth Engine does behind the scenes. So they just do computing a kind of hyper, in the, in the like, like, uh, high level of the pyramid layer on the fly. And you when you start zooming in, uh, you can, recompute like for every uh, different uh, levels of the pyramid. But with this technology, with this file format and the libraries that are around, you can choose that. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, will you show the code how to create these, um, let's say to use the Cox in full capacity? Do you have the code for that? Will we do that later or is it available somewhere? Yeah, it's available. So uh, I will. I will. I didn't prepare to uh, show it uh, because I will kind of. Yeah, I, I will do for a small area. But to do it, uh, basically, we use this. Uh, oh, gee, no. So what we actually do do is basically. So we have, for example, specifically to produce that image, the Sentinel data, it was a lot of scenes. So for example, Josep processed it, put in the cloud, we downloaded, and I don't know, like maybe thousands of uh, 
tiles. And we created this virtual mosaic. And when you do that, you actually create a virtual representation of that file. So, and we just do it bash, it's only two commands. So we just do like a kind of build VRT. You send a list of all your files. They, they are kind of spread all over the, the, the territory and you generate this VRT. And later we just use the GDAO translate to convert this VRT in an actual cloud optimized file. So it's, it's only this. And, and the, another thing is when you do this, uh, let me just get the URL. So for example, here, I will increase the font. So GDAO is already supporting it for quite a while, but basically use this virtual uh, system to, to interface, so basically to access the URL, and you can check the parameters for this file. So in here you can see like it's a 10 meter resolution, what is the projection system, what is the size, and here you have all the overviews. So, and, and also the block size. And in this way, for, for example, to build this file, it was really literally like two commands, build the VRT and convert the VRT in an actual cloud optimized files. You can play a bit with these blocks. So you can increase the block to make it faster for visualization or reduce the block size to better, to improve the, the point carry performance. But yeah, you need to make some decisions, but in general, it's pretty straightforward. We have all the technology around to do it. So, okay. Any other question before I go to the next steps? Okay, so basically I already showed the stack, but if you do it and you're just hosting, okay. Just one short question. Uh, do all the scenes that I want to have in my mosaic and then my uh, COG be afterwards, uh, do they have to fit in memory at the same time? Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. So if I build a virtual mosaic of okay. all my scenes, like thousands, as you said, do they do I all have to fit in memory when I create the COG with GDAL Translate? No, that, that's a good question. So when you create a VRT, it's basically an XML file with pointers for the actual files. If you try to, you can even work with that. You can build the VRT and just load different regions as we are doing here with COG. But when you do the conversion with the GDAO translate, GDAO it's quite smart and doesn't use all the, all the memory. So they do also by kind of chunks. So, and it works also in parallel for different overviews. So I think if you have eight overviews, it will use eight cores. So, but my, might take some time, that's the thing. So this Sentinel data, it took like some, like several hours to produce it and uh, this cog. Okay. So uh, I already show it, but if you just have a URL, you need to have a service or a protocol to have the actual access and to find these URLs. So, and for me, that's what basically stack is. So it's really like a, a a specification that provides this common language to access any kind of spatial temporal asset. And here asset can be an imagery, SAR, point clouds, data cubes, even like videos, but you have some minimal metadata that you need to provide like the time range, the, the bounding box as I was showing when I opened this file for the whole Europe. So, and you can organize in different ways. It's quite uh, flexible. Uh, but in essence, it's just an index to really take advantage and make all these uh, cloud native format files uh, accessible. So I think that's, and it's, it's, it's a lot. Uh, so basically uh, I will not uh, explain about all the aspects of the stack, but basically you have an API, the finite endpoints, you have the stack items, stack collection, and stack catalog. You can have multiple catalogs communicating each other. And here there is a very nice um, um, best practice guide. So we use it, it a bit 
uh, to define our own stack for the echo data cube. Okay, but let's do some practice. So, uh, because this is only about concepts, right? So, when you think about really build a data cube, uh, here I, I inserted actually three choices that you need to, to do. And so the first one is select a kind of a data provider. In general, uh, if you are working with uh, Earth observation data, uh, if you are a user, you, you might not have all the data that you need uh, like accessible in-house or in your computer, of course, because the data is like growing exponentially. So, and here are some options that you can use. And this is only about data provider, right? So for example, I don't know if you want to do some processing for Sentinel-5, you might be restricted here of the data providers that uh, put it available. But if you want to use like Sentinel-2 or Landsat-8, probably all these providers here uh, will uh, have a uh, way to support you. So this thing, for example, uh, we saw yesterday the, the Copernicus data space uh, ecosystem. So they are uh, making it available so with different uh, protocols. So I tried to uh, test it, the stack uh, implementation yesterday. So I saw that they are still working on it. So there are some tickets and they are uh, replying the GitHub that how, uh, because now as far as I understood, it's not really compatible with the Pi stack or the public APIs, but they are working to, to uh, fix it and, and make it. But there are other uh, APIs here uh, that they support. So the old data Sentinel hub uh, catalog. So these APIs are also uh, accessible. And, and for example, this is a, a, a data provider and uh, that it's uh, everyone here uh, kind of know. We had a talk about it uh, yesterday. So, uh, and so I will not open all this, but if you go to, for example, to AWS open data, as far as I know, you don't have kind of stack catalog for the Sentinel. So basically they are hosting this data in a kind of, uh, Kind of predefined uh, structure in the S3. So, for example, you kind of need to navigate to this structure. So, we don't have like an index for the scenes, but you need to kind of create the index by yourself. But the data is there. So, you can access directly the URLs, uh, but you need to do more work on your side. So, it's the same thing for the Google Cloud uh, data sets. So, they also provide, for example, here. If you go for the Sentinel uh, two, you can open some uh, examples here like this. And basically you have a kind of, they follow the tiling system, but this is like a, you can access through like a, a URL. It's a different protocol, but you can just access the data uh, straight away. So of course, if you are outside of their infrastructure, I will talk about it. You need to kind of move this data. So. The next choice, it's also uh, important. Uh, uh, there is also the Microsoft planetary computing. They have stack and they are supporting the, they have some of these uh, data set, not, not all. And they, also the earth search, it's uh, Sentinel-2 and, and I think Landsat also, but they have the stack. So, but it's a public catalog. And as far as I know, I tested it a bit and it's kind of slow because they, they probably limited the speed. This one is nice. So this is a stack uh, collection from the NASA Common Metadata Repository. And it's working with the harmonized Landsat uh, Sentinel. Uh, and and it's, it's working. It's also a bit slow, but if you do some point carries, they have some notebooks explaining how to use. And I put as here as extra because I think uh, it's a valuable information. So I were talking with Robert and Johannes Heist from Varney University, and they are using this to kind of stream all the planet data, NICFI, outside of uh, Google Earth Engine. So uh, I think Robert has a talk here, uh, but basically it's quite straightforward. Uh, for example, if you use Google Earth Engine, you can just uh, put change here, the endpoint, and uh, I think they are using CEPAL. And basically they use Google Earth Engine as a kind of database and they are classifying all the planet data, five meter for the whole Africa. 
So they managed to scale it. And it's, it's, an, uh, it's a nice solution if you want to work with planet data. There are some uh, constraints, of course, about the license and things like that. But on a technical side, that might be a solution because uh, it's a really a big archive and it's difficult to stream and manage it. Uh, so this is about data provider, right? You need to select, okay, which data provider I need to use. And the next obvious choice is uh, what, what computing and processing infrastructure should I use, right? So when we do that, uh, of course, it's dependent of the uh, Earth Observation data provider because you want to co-locate it. So basically, you want to put the cloud infrastructure close to the uh, data. So most of these uh, Earth uh, observation data providers, they also provide the computing engine. So uh, the Copernicus data space ecosystem, they are providing like a Jupyter notebook. So I, I tested yesterday, it's pretty straightforward. You can just open a notebook and start uh, working with some uh, limited uh, uh, virtual machine. So there is of course also the OpenEO uh, platform. So, and if you want to use that, uh, uh, if you want to have like really credits to starting using that. So Patrick is shared with this we, we, a while ago about this. You can find, you can get credits to research through this as a network resource funding and start using the, the platform. And here are basically the three cloud providers, right? If you use AWS, you should stick with AWS compute. So data it's co-located, you can scale. If you use Google uh, to uh, get the data, you should use Google Cloud Platform. And if you use planetary computing, there are two options. You can use like a Jupyter notebook and just open it straight. It's similar to the Echo, uh, Copernicus data system ecosystem. So, and uh, you can, I think the machine is quite strong. It's 64 gigabytes uh, of RAM, four cores. So you can just have access to the catalog and start to doing some tests. But of course, for production, they push the to use the Azure, Azure compute to access the data. So as I said, so uh, in the inside of Open Earth Monitor, we have partners using CEPAL. It's funded by FAO and it's quite well integrated with Google Earth Engine. And of course, you can always also have your own infrastructure. So that's what Open Geo Hub is doing. So basically, we do our, everything in house. But to do everything in house, you need to download the data. So basically, you need to move all this massive archives, at least your the product of your interest, you need to move for the for the same infrastructure and maintaining it. So it's it's quite some work. And the third choice, it's basically uh, which library you could use, right? So uh, there are quite some. So if you want to use, uh, like if you are more in the, this R word, you can use GDAO cubes. So GDAO cubes, it's actually, it's a way to harmonize and get all this and uh, build the proper data cube uh, with the accessing these archives and, and produce and, and save the files. So, and you have also SITS. Uh, uh, so we have Gilberto here with, with us. So basically SITS relies on top of GDAO cubes and add like several functionalities for machine learning and basically like uh, uh, quality control for training data. So there are quite some algorithms of deep learning also that prioritize the time uh, implemented there like out of the box. You have also post-processing, so mechanisms to do uh, active learning. And, and also it's, it's integrated with some of these uh, data providers that I, I said. So uh, Gilberto already uh, presented uh, in, in, in the past how it, uh, it works. And it, it's definitely a very nice solution and for sure uh, a good software that you could use to really make you. On the Python world, you have basically real X array. So it's basically a kind of extension from the X array that it's connecting with raster. So basically you build like the rasters and you access like all these uh, raster files and you build a, build a virtual representation first of this data cube. And, and later you can decide to get the proper data and active that lazy loading mechanism. So on top of that, they built this stack stack. It's kind of funny name. So they stack stack adds a bit more functionalities to do this 
processing. So for example, aggregate the data cube, do some overlay overview and things like that. But uh, as far as I saw it, there's no kind of machine learning and implementation to on top of it. So you need to do by yourself. You need to build the cube and later integrate with machine learning uh, kind of frameworks. So it's not something similar of what SITS does. And we also have from uh, our partners, uh, project partners, Brookmount uh, Brook uh, Consulted. Uh, and basically they are building this X cube. So it's a set of services that uh, it's mostly based in, in ZAR, but I was talking with uh, Antonio yesterday. So you can also connect the COGS and they are working to create a kind of Docker file easily to de deploy and, and really starting using uh, quickly and you can deploy in, in different infrastructures. And so, and internally as OpenGeo Hub, we build this in the, op in the Echo Data Cube, basically we build this EU map. Uh, so when we were starting the project, the Geoharmonizer, we just created this package not not the beginning, but in the end, we put it all the functions, everything here, the gap filling, we integrated with, uh, for example, machine learning uh, uh, pipelines, and we, we map it for here is an example of how to do land cover. And you can, for example, send like a random forest implementation and everything happens. Uh, and you can use this also to do uh, predictions like this. So, but recently we decided to rebrand it because <laughs> When we start doing some training, so uh, we were just saying you map, you map, you map, and some people uh, were asking, but I can use you map to do other work also in you know, other parts of the world. So, and basically now we are rebranding for like scikit map. So we are currently in this migration process, and this it's intended to be like a more generic uh, application for 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 machine learning. So we want to create a set of wrapper functions to enable, for example, the use of scikit-learn in like raster data cubes. So we are really in the middle of the process. So there is still some documentation uh, missing. And, and we also creating like a kind of, we are defining the whole, uh, like a new interface to do things. So you can run several process here and like aggregate by time, do the gap filling. So, and that's basically the, the, the library that we are using internally. So our inspiration here, it's actually the seeds because uh, as far as I know, there is no kind of similar solution in the Python uh, world. So that it's able to integrate all these different machine learning pipelines. So, and this is more generic, right? So if you want to build a data cube, you should think at least in these three aspects, but this more in a, technical aspect. So, but what, for example, OpenGeo Hub is doing, right? So uh, the idea here is share with you what we are doing and how we managed to scale up it and how we made this three choice. So basically we are working with these four data providers, AWS Open Data, NASA Earth Data. We also work with Google Earth Engine and the Glad Landsat Data. I didn't put Glad Landsat here because there's no service. They have an API, but now we actually move it all the data for our infrastructure. But for example, uh, if you want to do with some work with some daily data that it's available in Google Earth Engine, uh, you can do part of the processing there, download, for example, aggregated uh, images per month and do it the processing in your own infrastructure. So we did that to produce kind of monthly water vapor data sets inside of the Open Earth Monitor project. Internally, we have our own infrastructure. So we managed a kind of HPC infrastructure where we co-located the data and the processing service. And we are building everything with this scikit-map. So it's in Python implementation where we combine like raster, IO, GeoPandas. We also use GRASS, GIS, Whitebox tool. So uh, we have, we, it, as our own infrastructure, it's quite uh, uh, easy to start using as many as possible of the solutions that are around. So this is our current infrastructure. So basically we have about three petabytes of storage and more than thousand CPU threads. We are communicating. So we also have the problem even internally to move the data to the processing service because it's, it's literally like physically different service server. And now we are moving everything to like an infinite band protocol. 
So it speeds up like 40 times the network uh, speed. And basically we use Docker to have everything reproducible and we scale the processing with Slurm. So with Slurm, it's quite old solution for HPC. So it's very used in supercomputer infrastructures. So it's a kind of job scheduler where you can just uh, send, for example, the same code uh, to process different chunks of data. So what we do basically, it's this. So here's an example to do this computing for the whole world. So here we are processing modes. So it's kind of easy going if you think about it, the resolution, but still we need to have like 20, 20 we split the word in 23,000 tiles. You can, this tile is it's versatile, you just define it. So if you want to load more data in RAM, you just increase the size of the tile. But the key difference here is we manage it. So we have full control of uh, maybe if there's something goes wrong with that, or I don't know, maybe uh, the, we kind of blow up the memory of the servers. We can just play with the styles and we have full control of this distributing processing, uh, distributed processing. So basically we split the word tiles, we send ranges of tiles for all the nodes. And basically every nodes really read the data, execute data analysis might be like a classification uh, task, regression, like or like a time series analysis. And we, we we write the output back. So and we read from the processing the, the storage service. And so for example, when you have like other platforms, so we, we can see like, for example, if you use uh, X array and desk, you can use desk to kind of parallelize it. And it's possible. But what happens behind the scene, it's basically this. So basically you are kind of outsourcing the this kind of management of the Distribute this of the distributed processing to a library, but internally we prefer do it by ourselves because we have more control. So that's actually like a technical decision that we made. So and that's how it looks like when we do, for example, some something in the our servers. So every node has about ninety six uh, CPU threads, and of course we try to use it at full capacity. And here it's really like CPU bound, so you can see that it's using only three 30 gigabytes uh, in mem of memory. And we have a kind of a half terabyte. Now we expanded all the servers for one terabyte of RAM. So we can load like really big chunks of tiles. And in the end, we just create separated files. So all these tiles becomes like an individual output. And we use, as I explained, the GDAO VRT and a GDAO translate. So, and for example, maybe you want to do some reprojection, right? I don't know, you want to um, produce uh, a line with some uh, different bounding box or change the pixel size or change the projection system. You can use straight away like the GDAWAR. So you read all the tiles and you do the reprojection for like a target projection system, basically. And in the end, we have something like this, right? So this is basically uh, every two months, aggregated gap filled. Uh, modis data and this is available in stack so you can easily access all these images and and of course to build this uh, uh, animation but it's a representation of the data cube you have here like 126 dates and and this size for every image uh, of course we we made some decisions right so and when we do that uh, so we don't expect that this product it's actually like a silver bullet that will serve all the applications. But at least if you serve like some different communities or uh, some applications, we can kind of, they can access this data straight away and start doing some modeling. Um, that that's our goal, right? But maybe you want to use like a different aggregation system or a different aggregate uh, gap filling method. Uh, you need to process by yourself using this uh, kind of guide that I, I show with three decisions. And internally, what we do, we build all these ARCO data sets and we plug it in a kind of machine learning pipeline. So basically we do the overlay, we build the classification and the regression matrix. Uh, so here is a kind of uh, standard machine learning pipeline. We train models and we do uh, predictions. So we are constantly doing it internally. So we have quite some data organized. So for example, when we receive new training data, we just, uh, 
do the overlay and for example we can immediately start doing the modeling and maybe we miss some of the Arco data sets and we kind of download and organize using the same pipeline and basically we repeat it so we are doing it for two three years now and of course to implement this you can use different uh, libraries different languages so you can do it also in sits with more uh but processing with more machine learning steps and we are doing it with the eu map and now scikit map but you can do it with like reloading the rest array like x like like the the x array and use the scikit learn directly so there are plenty of options and so the way that i see that if if you do it properly like if you have all this public data providers, if you define the libraries, if you do like computational notebooks, you can really produce fully reproducible deliverables. And with that, I mean that uh, even the output, if you provide in, a, in also in this Arco uh, data set, so from the, for the Echo Data Cube, we show like land cover, we produce it land cover maps in this formats. Uh, so we, we put the data available, we create an open catalog, but we also invest time and create and document everything through computational notebooks and use the software libraries. So all this kind of fancy infrastructure here, you can show like a computational notebook and replicate all the steps for a single tile. And that's what, for example, basically we try to do for every product because it's important to be able to reproduce and share this kind of pipeline so other people can start in using it also and and of course when you talk about reproducibility we have different spectrum and and uh, the, we are aiming really to this gold standard we know that it's tricky so because you need to define several technical aspects but um, if you have like everything like properly documented like docker containers where you have libraries that you you define it with versions and really uh, it we believe that it should be possible. Okay, so now let's do the uh, hands-on. So here I, in the scikit map, there is a computational notebook that I prepared. And here it's a collab environment. So uh, you can do it also later. I will share the presentation. In the collab environment, it's the same. You can also load it in the Microsoft Planetary Computing. I, I I just use it collab because I know that the sharing mechanism works. So if you use collab, you can just create a copy here and execute all these steps by yourself. So you don't even need to have like a Python environment. And and here the, the notebook is taking time to load, but this is just like the visualization. And I will use my own environment because I want to show it how it works in, in practice. So let me just situate myself here yeah so this is exactly the same notebook that i was i think i have a yeah a visualization here i'll just close this and okay where it is okay i lost it here 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 for some reason i lost it just a second So here, I will just increase the font also. We will clean the notebook. So, and, and here I will, uh, the notebook is structured in two ways. So we provided in the scikit map a toy data set with some NDVI data and Landsat bands. So I will basically open it and visualize and explain how the we designed the, the library. And in the second step, I will do an integration with the stack. And for this uh, integration, it's basically uh, I'm accessing the Microsoft planetary computing, getting for a region, a small region, getting the data and creating the, the, 
the kind of the data cube basically. But of course, very uh, limited in size. So basically here, so I will go kind of straight, but here I'm loading, we, we provided an NDVI uh, toy data set. And when you do that, basically you have an instance of this raster data. So it's basically a kind of a representation that we did for the, uh, for the purpose of the library, but we designed it in this way because we want to integrate it with the, uh, the scikit-learn. So it's now it's strictly based in in, uh, in NumPy. So we didn't we are not using uh, X array, but it's something that we can uh, really consider for the future. But now it's when you open this raster data, it's basically like you have a GeoPandas with the kind of all the informations for the time series, and you have a raster array, uh, NumPy array. So here it's twenty four. Uh, images. This is already kind of ready to use at DataCube just to show the functionalities of the library. And you have here like start and end date. So you can locate all this uh, structuring time. You can do, for example, carries, right? Uh, give me all the images that are from 2000. Uh, and you also provide some helpers. So we are still documenting the, the, the library. I'm, I was working on it in the last days. And we created also this kind of plot function. So for example, this is something that we miss when we were doing modeling uh, with the scikit-learn because we have all this kind of um, uh, like array data organized in, for example, for some, when we do prediction with, we were, uh, it was necessary checking, for example, some of the covariates and images that we, uh, we're working, uh, I don't know, it was creating some artifacts in the predictions. So basically we designed it for, for uh, really see and, and give a, have a glance of the data set. So this is basically an NDVI Landsat time series aggregated by quarterly. So it's four images per uh, uh, year. So since uh, here I, I restricted from 2024, but in the Echo Data Cube you have even uh, since 2000. Uh, so we also created this animate function. So in, here it's a static plot, right? You can just, okay, maybe there's something uh, wrong with this image. So you can see that there are some gaps. And with the animate function, basically you can uh, play and see like uh, animation. So here it's nothing uh, special. It's just like the data is already in RAM. We are visualizing it and providing some uh, like co palette color and, and, and put the date here as a header. So, but if you check these images, you can see that there are some gaps. And I did that on purpose because uh, we have like a gap filling functionality. So if you go here in the, uh, there's this gappy true, just to really show that, okay, here it's a gap filling. I need to do the gap filling. And basically here, uh, we have this, uh, the, the library runs this uh, kind of standard where you can just run and put several processing operations like to run sequentially. So I will show how it works in for other data sets. And here it's basically, we have this temporal, uh, com it's a kind of seasonal convolution, but it's a gap filling interpolation in time. So basically we use different, uh, images to gap fill it and, and uh, provide at least some inputted data there. But uh, I will show in the last part of the notebook, you can also return a kind of metadata mask. And with this metadata mask, you can actually see uh, which pixels were gap filled. And that's really important and in which quality. So it's not just a matter to put at any cost here, like a, a value but to really run machine learning in the time series or do some time series analysis, you need to have like at least some value there. Uh, but we want, we are doing it providing uh, the most possible metadata. And so here you can see uh, we, we have these concepts of groups. So there was only NDVI and now we kind of added the name of the operation. So you can keep running it uh, I will show in, in other examples. And here, for example, it's uh, uh, 
it's basically this fluent interface. So basically it's similar of what our, our engine does. Uh, we are loading the data, we do the gap filling, and later I can rename this group. So I, I just back it for NDVI. I drop the input data. So I'm, I'm just sticking with the gap filled uh, data. And here I'm running like a temporal aggregation. So this is what we call like time aggregation. And here it's basically like you take all the images of the year and you compute two operations like percentile 50 and the standard deviation. And here we are doing it for the uh, gap filling for the gap filled data. And here you have a kind of log of what happened. So it applied the CISO convolution, the time aggregated. So the idea here, it's all these operations we want to kind of, uh, we, we use internally and we want to provide like documentation and also like everything here runs in parallel. So for example, the gap filling, use all the cores, the time aggregates use all the cores and do it like for uh, multiple periods. And in the end, now you can see that you have the original NDVI that was actually gap filled. And here you have more two groups, basically the standard deviation and the percentile 50. So yearly and, and here you, it's the time frame. So it's also like adjust this time frame and provides like to keeping uh, updating the, the structure. And when you do this, so basically here you have the plot and you can visualize now like a yearly time series. So basically we aggregated this to produce like a kind of uh, early time series and you can do some analysis with that or uh, save. So, but this is a kind of easy, right? So this is just to, so it's, it's an NDVI data, it's already there. And we also have this concept of, this is only one band, right? We use it only the uh, NDVI, uh, but in the toy data set, we also, have this kind of uh, multiple groups. So it's actually multiple bands. But here I on purpose call it group because when we do machine learning, we have different data sets that have actually different temporal resolutions. Some of these data sets are static. So for example, here, now we have NDVI with this toy data set, SWOR1 band, and the, what I'm calling static. And the static, if you check it, there is no, of course, this is located at some point in time, but for the purpose of the library, we didn't define like a start and end because for this data here, I want to use only in the model. And this is basically uh, like a DTM elevation and slope. So when we do the modeling uh, with the scikit-learn, basically we use temporal data and we kind of stack also some static data. So for the, Temporal data, you have, for example, the NDVI from one year, 2010, and the NDVI from 2020. And you have points in both times. So we use pixels located in the space and in the time. But when we use the static data, I don't have DTM for all the years. So what we do, and, and we basically replicate this static information across all the years. And that's a way to embed these kind of static layers in the modeling. So that's why I kind of design it in this way. So it's a kind of three dimensional structure where I keep adding different uh, groups of layers. And, and what is kind of interesting here is when you do this, uh, when you do the time aggregate, now I have two groups, basically two bands, NDVI and SWOR1. And this operation we run for every group. So it means that I can, now I have yearly time series, like uh, aggregated for NDVI, but also for SWOR1. So if you have like five, 10 bands, it will replicate the same operation for, for all, the, all the, the, the groups. And here it's basically the yearly uh, time series now for SWOR1 and NDVI. And you can visualize, for example, for SWOR1, how it looks like, but it's, it was the same operation applied to different groups. So, and of course we also did that because when we process the Landsat, basically we replicate the same aggregation or the same operation for multiple bands. And we want to keep the track of the whole process. So what I'm showing here, for example, it's basically what runs for every tile in our servers. And, and we have kind of uh, uh, other class to run it uh, in, in parallel. 
and we use this LERM to run in a distributed way across the different servers. So this is only with toy data set, it's fine. But now let's do like a proper integration, right? So uh, we have all these stack collections and uh, now we want to actually kind of build the data cube from scratch. So here I'm using the Microsoft planetary computing, uh, Sentinel-2 level uh, 2A. And basically you need to have these libraries. So by stack client, leaf map and the planetary computing to get the token. So the first thing is uh, let's load this leaf map and just find a place in the world, right? This will actually access the stack and download the data for my, my computer, right? So I'm limited here by the internet. So that's why I explicitly said to not select like a really huge area, otherwise uh, will not work. So I will go for the area that uh, where we are based, close to Vaningen. So uh, here, for example, and I have this nice tool to draw like a polygon and I can see the area here, right? This is fine. So now I can retrieve the bounds. So this is, is the bounds. Uh, and now with this bounds, basically I'm instantiating like a client pointing to the planetary computing. Here it generates a kind of authentication token. I'm sending the bounds and I'm getting all the images from January 2023 to June. And it's Sentinel data. And when I do that, it will perform the query and it returned for me 70 stack items. So here what's happening is every of these items has all the Landsat uh, Sentinel bands. So if you click here, you can go to the metadata and you can see that you have different bands here. And these bands also have different resolutions. So, and so this is what the stack returns to us. And now in the raster data, you have this from stack items. So here you can send the stack items, which bands you are interested in this kind of verbose. So just to follow the process, this first call, it's basically accessing the stack and building the metadata information to read the raster data. So it will create a list of URLs and files, put the dates and retrieve everything from the stack. And later it re will read it, but just for the bounds. Uh, so of course the bounds needs to be connected with the other query. When you read like the data in this way, I will start executing and uh, when you read the data in this way, it's basically retrieving all the information from the stack and it will read the, the, the yeah, here we can see. So it basically built because I need to have band two, three, four. So basically blue, uh, green, red in IR, 10 meter and the scene cloud uh, uh, classification. So this SL information, I will show some, yeah, here, scene classification layer uh, to remove the clouds. So when I do that, it's 350 raster individual files that I'm reading. And for that bounce, it's basically, it's producing like an image with this size for me. And, and when I read that, I need to specify like several GDAO options to make things a bit more performatic. So increase, for example, the timeout and things like that. It depends of where you are running. But we want to kind of embed also some default options in the library. But here I was actually testing different uh, ways to, to kind of uh, read and activate this lace loading in a better way. And so it's still reading. And after that, sometimes, for example, I, I, I had some problems because he, here's literally like getting the data from the cloud and creating like a, a structure in memory. Uh, and after that, I can run the operation. So we basically created this uh, class, this, this method to really integrate and put all this uh, raster data in, uh, in our format. So we could use with the functions that we already uh, built. So, and for the, so let's see, it's still running. So it, when I tested, it was about like two minutes. Uh, 
sometimes, for example, crash it. So I, I, I remember that for some reason, reach it, for example, the timeout. So because uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the, how the data is organized in the in the data provider, you can uh, reach the timeout. So basically, I was uh, kind of redoing it and, and like executing again to get the data. And here, for example, you could, so I, I selected this region, but considering that this is a, uh, like a web a GIS application, you can literally check anywhere in the, in the world to get it. And if you like activate this, uh, the Google hybrid, you could uh, like really see the, the location of the, of this, the, the cities and, and situate yourself better. So yeah, it's still loading. Um, okay, I will, let's see if I can explain this in the meanwhile. So if we have the data, uh, I will plot it and show, for example, a kind of uh, multi-band composite. So, and in this way, uh, we can actually see the real color, uh, like the RGB and, and in the same way that we did the plot. And, and we will see that basically there are several uh, clouds. So, and because of that, uh, it's important to use this cloud mask. And with the cloud mask, it's basically, okay, it's coming, all right, here's this. So that's the data that I have. So it's 350 like individual bands. And I have basically five bands here, including the cloud cover. So if I do that, I can see like a false, not, it's not a false color here, it's actually the RGB, but I can see like how it looks like across the whole period that I, I was uh, visualizing. And it's basically a lot of clouds. And this visualization, of course, it's, it's only a glance, right, to analyze and see. And, and now uh, we have the cloud, uh, the scene classification layer, and with the scene classification layer, basically, uh, you can see here how they implemented and things like that. So Microsoft already uh, provides it. And okay, so now what I will do is for this kind of time series here, I have a bunch of clouds. So there is this process called calc. It's just to calculate some spectral index, but also apply a kind of mask. So, and here I'm sending to this calc, I'm just saying, use this key A, quality assessment cloud uh, uh, classification layer, and use these uh, values as mask. And doing that, it will first mask all the pixels and later run like set of index. So you could have like different formulas here. And after that, it drops the uh, cloud mask because I don't need it anymore and runs aggregation by monthly. So basically here, I'm removing the clouds, calculating the NDVI, doing the monthly aggregation for two operations. And when I do that, it will basically show here how it uh, is performing. So all, every of these operations runs in parallel. So we implement in this way, otherwise we cannot take advantage of the, the, all the cores that we have. And when we do that, it's basically, so you can see the execution time, what happened. And this operation specifically, it's executed for all the bands. So band two, three, four, and eight, and including the NDVI. And if you look at it again, now you have a time series, monthly, and kind of cloud free. So you still have some like missing, like some cloud problems here. And this is like completely gapped, right? So this is January. It's, you don't have like much data availability here, a lot of clouds. And so to fix that, you can use the, the same gap filling method that we did. And again, here I'm just seeing like three bands, but it executes for everything, right? So, and when you do that, now it's calculating the gap filling for all the individual bands that were aggregated. And when we plot it, now we basically 
In this case, the gap filling cannot do much. We only have six images. So it's basically propagating the values from this to this image. So here we have something, but of course it's quite limited. If we had like a really like a long time series, like 20 years, it will take full advantage of different years and aggregate it in different ways. And of course, I want to uh, save it now. So I will delete that just to make sure that we have uh, everything. So. Okay. Fine. So I have everything in memory, but I want to save it, right? And then just need to do two gear. So what happened here? So I generated about uh, 120 files in my uh, folder. So basically, if you go to docs notebook, so all the data is here now, and you can see that you have this. So I didn't even like inform the file name. I could, of course, in the library, you can define the file name, but the library just keeps adding, like considering the operation, what, what was used to uh, generate it. And I will open like, for example, let me just get my .gis here. So this is, let's open the NDVI. So this is the NDVI time series. So I could just drag it in my, one GIS, so it's yeah five images. Where's my one GIS? Here, it's a bit difficult with this. It's fine. So yeah, so I can just drop it here, and also I would like uh, the last thing that I want to show is this for the NDVI. You also have the the key A. So it's here, it's a bunch of files. Yeah, yeah, here's the key A, like this. I will group NDVI. Yes. So, and basically, let me show it here. So, yeah, here. Okay, so this is my NDVI time series. So that I just generated now. And they are like all the, and these are the two images that we get filled. So of course here in the QuantGIS, you can play with uh, different uh, colors, but I also loaded the key A because it's really important to provide this layer. So this means that we did get filling, get filled this part. So, and if you check the values here, it's, you have a kind of distance. So this is, this is value four and the range it's between zero and 100. So where we didn't get filling, it's 100. So it's best quality, but this is just kind of four. So it's, it's a kind of quality assessment. It's not just like a mask where we did the gap filling, but we try to also embed some sort of quality information. So, and, and as we have a limited time series here, the quality here, it's not so so great. And for the other image, it's same. So uh, yeah, that's the hands-on part. So I have one last slide. I'm a bit lost now here. Okay. So basically, yes, main takeaways. So uh, we have all this data like out there and different strategies to create data cubes. And I really believe that it's important to promote this kind of ARCO mosaics. And that's one way to structure the data and take advantage of fully from these cloud native uh, protocols. So we have also other formats. So for example, we have ZAR and our uh, partner and friends of, uh, that are developing Xcube, they are creating overviews when this pyramid is structured in ZAR. So uh, yeah, there are quite some, uh, ways to do it. Uh, I'm just explaining how we do it internally at Open GeoHub. Uh, I'm not saying that that's the best solution, but it's the solution that we are using. But for me, the, the key parts are when you really want to define and build like a data cube, uh, you need to define an earth observation data provider processing infrastructure and specialized processing libraries. 
and you have multiple options for that. It's it's good, and and also uh, you have like several machine learning and open source frameworks. Uh, they are available, but uh, still we still need some work to integrate that. So, for example, something that SITS did it's great because you really kind of boost the uh, usability of these data cubes on to apply machine learning pipelines easily and straightforward. We are trying to do the same here with the scikit-map because of course it makes also our internal work more fast and also can contribute with the community. So in the OMC, we really will produce like terabytes of our code data sets uh, and we want to uh, like in the, as the Sentinel data that I show in the beginning and we want to do like that to really make it more accessible and integrate with different machine learning pipelines for different applications. So if you want to build like a very specific data cube, you can go for it, but we truly believe that OMC can contribute, provide a kind of post at pre-processed data that can serve, for example, different user communities, not only like the kind of remote sensing uh, specialized people. Yeah, and that's all, and thank you for the uh, attention. Thanks a lot and very nicely explained. So so that's really a workshop type of, of uh, event. I have two comments maybe. So working with X-Ray a bit, um, um, my first idea was, or my first uh, uh, thought I had was, it would be great if you would have implemented this rather as, let's say, extension to X-Ray or, or, or a popular library um, rather than having your own. That also goes probably in, in our own direction. I have the feeling that many of us are developing similar things and reinventing wheels rather than reusing stuff because I've seen similar things from OpenEO and others are also doing processing solutions. And we are creating, of course, a great diversity of solutions that do very similar things, but but uh, to gain the critical masses, of course, <clears throat> sorry, is of course then, then um, probably the the biggest challenge. And the other thing you mentioned uh, at the end again, uh, with ZA and the, the X-Array world, you can do pretty much the same, I would say. Um, so they, they both stand quite uh, equally next to each other, I would say, in terms of features and, and cloud readiness and, and uh, everything you you explained for, for cloud optimization basically also applies to ZA. Yeah, that was it. Okay, yeah. When I was preparing for the workshop, I I had to remember myself why why I did like that. So <laughs> because I at some point I considered like really use the X array, and and I think it's so I I kind of designed it like that because I think the main requirement, but maybe it's not a, a strong one, is uh, when we do this kind of machine learning applications, we do in a space time. So we have the data that are kind of organized in a temporal domain, right? With some predefined temporal resolution and we have data that are in different resolutions. So to organize it with the X array, I should have some sparse structure uh, or maybe different uh, X array uh, structure. So, and I, I, I tend to create like that because it's a kind of really straightforward to start using modeling for the scikit learn, but uh, that's for sure something that uh, we can uh, discuss and, and try. I'm not saying that that's the, the best one, but it was something that we were using a, a while ago. And also uh, the X-Array might have some overhead. I'm not sure about that. I, I, I saw some benchmarks. It's quite straightforward, but yeah, it's something that we should definitely explore for sure. Hi. Uh, about the raster data object from scikit-map, when you create it from a stack item, does it preserve the stack metadata? Uh, yeah, the metadata that we are using. So basically, uh, it's it saves the 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 bounding the bounce of the image, but also the the temporal. Now I'm I'm not getting all the metadata, but at some point we could kind of save 
the like the, the metadata and like the description and things like that internally but currently no and maybe reconstruct a graph with uh, inputs and processing steps i think that could be beneficial okay for reproducibility yeah. More questions? This will not surprise you, but my question is always like, um, do we need to teach this to, let's say, to people who want to do time series machine learning on image archives? Right, because the process is basically okay. There are all these files, and so when you have to go through them and go through them, and this is just a lot of work. Or couldn't you just sort of say, work on the image collection level, so to speak, and and sort of use that abstraction and and take all that sort of going through the files away from uh, from the end users? Would that be something that you can imagine would 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 help the world forward? Yeah, that's a very good point. And so the, the way that I see is, so when you ma really make, you need to create this data cube, you need to do a lot of decisions, right? How you aggregate the data in this case, for example, how we remove the clouds, do the gap filling. So I don't think this is for every type of user, but for some applications, it might impact a lot. So for example, uh, we are doing this, basically this workflow that I presented here, we are running it for the whole Landsat archive. So it will be about 40 days of processing. But before we starting it, we, we did some tests and we use it a gap filling approach that kind of goes and get observations also from the future and from the past. So it's a kind of moving window and try to find the best observation to fill it. And when we tested in Europe, it was great. But when we move it to the Amazon region, we saw that and we had some areas to control. We saw that the forestations that were happening, like area, the forested areas that were happening two years after it was a kind of propagating to the past. So, and depending on the way that we define this gap finish strategy might impact the, this data cube collection. So I don't believe that everyone should do your own data cube, but I think it's something in between. So you should provide these collections really analysis ready for users. And probably the users will be people from other communities, I don't know, like from ecology or that works with like modeling uh, disease and things like that in like maps. But uh, so, uh, but you also need to provide like for some application and really specific domains, you should provide some sort of ways to build it and, and integrate it. But yeah, I, I think for, I personally believe like it's something in between. So some users will really need to go and make all these decisions to build a data cube that it's suitable for a specific application. But maybe with like analysis ready collections, we could attend like 80% of the application, for example. Yeah, I, so my question was not about the amount of control on the sort of modeling decisions, but more sort of confronting the user with the details on how the data are stored. That is what I think is you could get away with. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, right. Like the whether technical... it's a czar or whether it's a cog and whether things are bands in a cog or individual, whatever, and small or large. And so that level sort of, uh, that, that is, I think, something that you could you could completely get away. Okay, from. and just and focus in there. Yeah, okay. Focus on, on, on the things you do with it, right? Okay, yeah, I see the point. Yeah, that that's, I, I fully agree, yeah. I am more or less uh, external, but uh, I always see these kind of things with Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 data because they are high resolution, long time series, and blah, blah, blah. Now, probably, we are also developing a similar high resolution product, not a meter, but uh, one kilometer global or Europe. And uh, doing the same processing is, uh, is probably something that uh, I don't know. The question is, is there anybody exploring, uh, I don't know, not working just with Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, but also with, uh, I don't know, other, other data like, I don't know, 
I, I'm working with climate, so precipitation, so most of evaporation, all these kind of things, doing a filling at that resolution, blah, blah, blah. Is there anybody working already on that or not? That's my question. If you don't have an answer. Yeah, I, I personally don't know. So <laughs> uh, with Sentinel-1 specifically, I know that it's, yeah, it's a different kind of domain, right? It's, it's a radar it's a data and it's a bit, it's really tricky. So you have different sets of pre-processing. So I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but something that I see that it's my lack in the community is these pre-processing steps for Sentinel. We need, we need to kind of maybe uh, implement it in a way that it's more accessible. So for example, I was talking with Huberto. So I know that Johannes I from FUR, they work with Sentinel-1 to derive the first station uh, alerts. So and Sentinel-1 makes sense because you can see like under the trees basically. And so when he implemented a kind of pre-processing step for a specific for his application, but it's in kind of inside of Google Earth Engine, they do the whole pipeline there. So for example, Gilberto is working to kind of put that in a different infrastructure. So I think he wants to do it in the, with the Brazilian data cube. So, and for example, this might be something that uh, if we try to make a bit more generic, we could try to uh, use that. But this is specifically for the Sentinel-1. And also uh, we tested, I think one year ago, there is this kind of global seasonal uh, aggregation for Sentinel-1. They also did several pre-processing and they put the data available. But to do global analysis, we saw that at least like five, like maybe 80% of places in, in, in some like Asia, I think Canada were missing. So um, we started talking with them and, and so we, my experience, it's basically like I just tested it and we didn't uh, integrate it. But I think it's definitely it's something that we could improve and do in the context of the project. 